T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Copy you one alpha. Alright. Polaris Dawn has finally launched and the mission is just getting started. It is 447 AM on Tuesday, September 10th. They were able to make the second opportunity work during the four hour launch window and all four of the crew members are now on their way to the first ever private commercial spacewalk that will happen Thursday, September 12th, which I also plan to live stream. Also, this is a really cool interactive feature from SpaceX where you can actually follow Dragon on its mission. Go to SpaceX.com slash follow hyphen Dragon. A uh, really interactive map and it shows you real time where Dragon is. Now, granted, a lot of us had to stay up late to watch this live, but it was truly worth it because this is an amazing moment in history and for humanity. This mission will not only benefit future space flight and human missions to Mars, but it will also bring back research and data studying the human body so that we can understand how to better handle ourselves in deep space. Now, just to give you a little idea of the timeline before the spacewalk on Thursday, September 12th, Dragon will initiate a two day pre breathe process to prepare the crew for their upcoming spacewalk. It was truly surreal to watch this live considering that I've met Jared twice now and to know someone who is launching on such an epic mission was really crazy. I had goosebumps and chills the entire time and I'm so happy for the crew as they've waited for a long time for this launch. When I interviewed Jared back in June when they thought it was going to be in July, he said that it was very bittersweet because they had spent so much time training as a team and really becoming a family. And so I'm, I'm so happy that they finally got to launch, but of course the mission is not over yet and things are about to get really crazy. Now, like I said, they've done a lot of training, but they were also able to get some wise words from someone I also know, the Apollo astronaut and moonwalker, Charlie Duke, who I was able to go on a zero G flight with, he sat down with the crew to talk about their missions and respective spacewalks. Welcome to our mission control. Thank you very much. We copy you down, Eagle. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. What uh, emotions run through your head as you watch that? For Apollo 11, it was really tense. You know, the tension in mission control was through the roof. You know, I was more tense than that landing when I actually did it. Because, you know, in the spacecraft, you're seeing all the systems, whereas in mission control, you're just looking at a little screen, you know. And I was never were this big. They were just little things. First off, I want to say thank you for inviting me to come out and uh, get a briefing from y'all and maybe throw a little piece of advice every once in a while to you. You're one of the 12 humans in history that has gotten to walk on the, the face of the moon, and now you're Sitting here at SpaceX, I'm, I'm curious what your, your, your aspirations, your hopes, your dreams are for the future of human space exploration. Well, I'm excited about uh, the privatization of space. When it first came about, I was a little dubious, but then it was quickly obvious that SpaceX knew what they were doing. And I've been a big supporter of what SpaceX is doing in, in space and manned and unmanned launches. I'm impressed with this facility and the first time I've been here. Well, sir, it is a real honor. It is a real honor to have you here and have this conversation. Polaris Dawn, sir, is the, the first of, uh, you know, up to three missions that are contemplated. So we're going to vent down the vehicle and, uh, and conduct a, uh, a spacewalk. And we're going to test out a new spacesuit that um, the engineers at SpaceX here have been developing. Mm -hmm. It's to learn really as much about the this new generation suit that SpaceX has built and then the entire operation associated with it. I'll be one of the crew members that goes outside the vehicle. 
uh, Sarah will be as well. And then um, Kit and Anna are gonna be inside the vehicle in uh, kind of supporting capacity and be the eyes and ears of, uh, while we're outside. Is that visor assembly separate from your? The whole thing is It's all integrated. Yeah, it's a spiral waist zipper that we uh, don and doff the suit. It's important to have a suit that works. I mean, it's mobile and fits. Sir, based on your training experiences, what was the most memorable uh, thing you went through? Let me cover something that's very similar to y'all's, and that's the uh, transverse EVA. Are you ready, Charlie? Roger, copy. Looks like the old move. Both the Apollo 15, 16, and 17 had uh, no problems with the transverse EVAs. They're very spectacular. I mean, the view, I mean, that was my most impressive memory really is to float out and there was the earth down here about 180,000 miles away and my job basically was hook myself in so I don't float off and hold on. How long are you depressurized? So for the, the spacewalk, based on our the vehicle design and what we can support, we have about two hours end to end for both depressurizing external operations and then repressurizing the spacecraft. Um, but we'll all get suited up, depressurize the spacecraft, and then two people, one at a time, will go outside, come back in before we repressurize the spacecraft. My advice is don't let go. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you well, and thank you. While on orbit, the Polaris Dawn crew will conduct 36 research and science experiments from 31 partner institutions, and this will expand our knowledge of humans adapting, living, and working in space. We are in the Houston SpaceX office today. We are here for our what we call L-30 or launch minus 30 days data collection for all of the research that we're doing on our mission. We have about 40 experiments and a number of those require data collection pretty close to launch date. And so we are doing all of that data collection today as well as doing some refresher training just to make sure we're really sharp on all of our procedures when we go to flight. There's a lot of steps uh, for each one of these uh, science experiments. They're beneficial for not only um, improving and enhancing healthcare here on Earth, but it helps us continue this uh, progression with space exploration. What Kid and Anna are doing with the, uh, the endoscope uh, up through the nose and looking down at the vocal cords, I mean, that is uh, not something easy to perform, uh, you know, in a hospital environment, let alone in space. They certainly stand to learn a lot from it. Uh, Re-establishing someone's airway, that's, that's worthwhile to know if we're going to Mars someday. Um, but I think that's a tough one to perform uh, in space. And, uh, but you got two really uh, highly motivated individuals that are going to try and conquer it. In space, there's inflammation. We don't have the impact of 1G pulling on that fluid. So we need to better understand what that inflammation looks like. And once we have a better understanding, we can develop the procedures and the equipment necessary to handle any type of triage situation. When we stepped into this virtual reality scenario, I think Kid and I liked it a lot because they're flying a spacecraft on Mars to kind of gather like hand-eye coordination, motor skills, some cognitive abilities now, and then they're gonna compare it to, to post-flight as opposed to whether or not we can successfully land on Mars. One of the unique things of our, our missions, they're three to five days length. You maybe can't study the super long duration things, but what you can study is what happens immediately when you get up there and how soon these things uh, start to take place. So this big problem in the astronaut community is called SANS, and it's where the astronaut's eyesight and ocular health start to degrade over time. So they will be wearing a contact that actually makes them look like a cyborg. It has little coils that can measure the interocular pressure. And then we can start testing countermeasures that might actually be able to prevent some of those negative effects. We are doing an experiment called GDS disorientation. And this experiment, we wear a set of electrodes that sends electricity essentially through our brain between our inner ears and stimulates a disorientation and, a, and an imbalance to train astronauts' adaptation to different G environments and hope to quicken that readaptation. One of the things that we're doing with ultrasound is we are going to be collecting imagery of 
our veins and identifying whether there's actually bubbles forming when we are changing cabin pressure. It's very possible that nitrogen will bubble out into our blood. If we see bubbles, it will be completely normal and okay if we do see bubbles, but we are hoping to capture that on, on ultrasound. In order for us to become multiplanetary, we've got to overcome some of these challenges associated with space exploration on longer duration missions. What we gather on orbit in a zero-g environment, in a vacuum, will help us continue this cause in further in space exploration. And a lot of those experiments look highly uncomfortable. So why is this spacewalk so important? Well, this is the first ever private commercial spacewalk, and here is some of how they were able to prepare for such a feat. EBA stands for extravehicular activity, and it's any sort of operation in space where a human is getting out of the spacecraft. So in the case of Polaris Dawn, we're gonna be testing the mobility of the suit. We're gonna see if the in-space operation matches the training we've done here in Hawthorne. There's really a lot of different things that can happen during an EBA, and this is the first step for Dragon and SpaceX. When I first started working at SpaceX, I never thought I'd be training a crew to do an EVA. It's brand new, it's so unique, we've never done anything like this before, and so we wanted to make sure we had the best possible training program for this mission. We want to see if we can train a spacewalk on Earth in a way that's representative of what it feels like in space. Even though only two people are going to be going outside during this first EVA. All four crew will be in EVA suits going down to vacuum. Dragon was always designed to vent to full vacuum, but we've never taken a full Dragon capsule down to vacuum, and this will be the first time we do it in space. We actually put crew into a chamber at Johnson Space Center in Houston and had them live the exact profile that they will experience, and making sure that no one actually experienced uh, decompression sickness. We have a couple new training assets for Players Dawn to train the EBA specifically. The suspension system that we have is situated on top of the platform of our capsule simulator. The lines drop through the hatch. They attach to a single crew member inside the capsule. We can lift them up and get them situated so that they can egress the capsule and perform their tasks at Skywalker, the mobility aid. The Skywalker, what's amazing to me is a lot of people are going to think it's a metallic structure just bolted to the top of Dragon, but a lot of development effort testing went into the Skywalker. So we actually used similar technology as we have in the Super Draco chambers to apply a thermal barrier coating to the outside of the Skywalker. That is going to be a really, really amazing mobility aid on the front end of Dragon. We also developed a sideways simulator. so we flip the hatch on its side. In the event the hatch fails to close, they can manually close the hatch. We have them do that in a sideways suspension system so gravity isn't helping them close or helping them open that hatch mechanism. It's new development for Dragon, it's new development for SpaceX and the industry as a whole. So this is a great example of where Polaris Dawn is forcing the team to innovate in a way that adds safety and reliability to every Dragon mission going forward. That's this huge challenge for us to go solve, but that's also an opportunity for us to solve the problems that we have to go figure out anyway for our larger goals, like putting people on Mars. The Polaris Dawn objectives are the first step towards that ultimate flight with, with humans inside of Starship, which is right along the SpaceX development path that, that we have towards getting to the moon and Mars. This mission is packed with firsts and with crazy milestones, including the fact that this will be the highest humans have traveled in Earth's orbit since the completion of the Apollo program over 50 years ago. So Falcon 9 launched Dragon to an elliptical orbit of 190 times 1200 kilometers. It orbited the Earth eight times before raising itself to an apogee of 1400 kilometers, the highest humans have traveled in Earth's orbit in over 50 years.
And of course, you see them sitting in the new EVA suits. They look pretty comfortable on the way up. The EVA suit is a scalable design with the intent to create millions of these suits to help make life multiplanetary. This is designed with mobility in mind and SpaceX teams incorporated new materials, fabrication processes, and novel joint designs to provide greater flexibility while also incorporating enhancements for reliability and redundancy during a spacewalk. When a crew member is pressurized in a suit, the soft portions of the suit become rigid. They need actual flexor and rotational joints to allow them to move around. It's kind of like a suit of armor uh, made of fabric. Uh, we innovated in flexor joints to allow uh, easy bending at the elbows and the knees, as well as a collapsible rotator joint that exists on the shoulder, which allows the suit to remain nearly fully soft, but when pressurized is a rotational bearing. The difference between the IVA and the EVA suit is that on the IVA suit, the zipper system location is in the inseam. Uh, but since we needed to have lots of mobility on our EVA suit, that was not the preferred choice. By moving the zipper system from the inseam to the waist, we mitigated the risk of the stress of the zipper. Another big element was also the, the thermal side of things. The crew is obviously exposed to a much more extreme thermal environment during the EVA. So we wanna make sure that the inside of the suit is comfortable for them um, and that as they interface with parts of the vehicle that that is safe for them to touch as well. The EVA suit is built and designed here at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. We wanted to have something that's easy manufactured that we can handle here in house. So we developed this new material, so it's fabric based. We actually added a new layer to the suit, uh, which we refer to as the Faraday layer. And this is a conductive cage around the suit that shields the suit from external electric fields. The helmet on the EVA suit uh, looks very similar to the IVA suit, but it is really a, an all new design of that helmet. Um, it's much more robust from a thermal structural perspective since it will be taking more extreme temperatures. We are really excited to introduce this new single pane visor helmet to the world of spacesuits. The EVA suit visor is made of polycarbonate and is coated with copper and ITO or indium tenoxide. These two coatings together reflect the sun away from the crew as well as reflecting infrared heat back to the crew when they are facing deep space. Our suit has a HUD or heads up display, which is a small display screen in the helmet, which is transparent, which allows the crew to see through the display to have unfettered access during their EVA. But it also provides critical telemetry to the crew. So pressure, temperature, relative humidity. We're trying to improve the technology and streamline it in one way. And at the same time, we're also trying to get it more and more manufacturable with each generation. The ultimate goal is that you can put on a spacesuit and go out and get work done anywhere in the solar system um, and not feel like you're wearing anything more than you normally wear every day. Now, because it's five in the morning and I've been up all day, I will have to wrap this video here, but I will continue to cover this. So if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, give it a comment for the algorithm and subscribe to Ellie in Space so you don't miss future coverage. Good night.